like I said earlier, we are talking with Jonathan. Is it Crocker? Crocker, yes. Okay, Jonathan Crocker from Frank August. He's been making quite a splash so far with this fabulous bottle. So I'm excited to get into all the things. Me as well. Thank you for having us. Of course. Thank you for joining me. I appreciate it. So let me just, for those who haven't seen the bottle yet, if you've been living under a rock, it's this beautiful yeah, bottle right we'll here. Yes. Double will, you be, uh, will you be sipping with me? Yes, of course. Fun. Okay, fab. All right, well, let's dive right into it. I'm going to jump into the obvious first. We're not going to, we're not going to dance around that one. This will be the first time I have met any producer. I counted and called, so I had to. I oh, had no to, worries. So I couldn't hear what you were saying. I apologize. Oh, yeah, no worries. Um, so what I was saying is I'm not going to dance around the obvious because it's okay. one of the things that people are talking about the most when it comes to specifically you being behind this brand, which I think is so great. Um, I don't think I've ever met anyone of Asian descent <laughs> producing whiskey. I don't know if you identify as Asian American because I don't know where you were yes. born and all the things, but yes. um, I think that's so dope. Yeah. So the... tell me. Um... Oh, go ahead. No, no, finish what you're saying. I was just going to say, I'm sure we're going to touch upon it, but I think the the time that we're living in uh, within bourbon has never been more diverse. You know, diverse mm -hmm. in age, it's getting younger and younger, diversity in sex, more women are drinking bourbon than ever. I think the latest statistic is 35% of all bourbon drinkers are women. Diversity, diversity in ethnicity, Asian American, African American, Indian American, you know, it's no longer just this old white gentleman's drink anymore. So, yes. Yeah, yeah, and I'm loving that very much. Yeah. So, especially on the producer end, I think that's so great. Yeah. So, um, just tell me a little bit about yourself in general. One, how did you even, career wise, where did you start and what even got you into whiskey and particularly sure. whiskey production? So, uh, my career started, I mean, if we go all the way back, uh, after I graduated, I taught high school for a year. Um, so, that was many moons ago, about 23 years ago. So, 23 years ago, I could have been your English or history high school teacher. <laughs> Uh, and then through a series of kind of serendipitous events, um, it led me to the agency side of the business. So I worked for a number of different ad agencies for a while, then transitioned into magazine publishing. And then through that, started my own consulting agency and got into fashion for the last 10 years, um, had been working within the fashion industry. And then when the pandemic hit, it really provided me and my two business partners the opportunity to kind of pursue this wishful idea that we've had for about five or six years of starting our own bourbon brand. Um, so that's kind of how, you know, the, the pandemic really was the catalyst to get things moving uh, more than just, you know, late night conversations at the Barry Hotel lobby bar talking about it to actually yeah. seeing, is this something that we can really truly explore um, in a professional capacity? That is dope. So you started out, did you start out primarily as like an enthusiast then? Yeah, I mean, all three of us are big bourbon drinkers. Um, okay. I um, was very fortunate to have met um, a good friend of mine about 10 years ago, Drew Colesvein. Mm -hmm. So Drew, um, for those of that don't know, is the master distiller um, owner of Willet. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you're going to have a, a friend in bourbon, he's a good friend That's to have. That's the friend to have, exactly. Yeah. So uh, we met when I was a partner in a leather goods brand based out of Nashville. And we had some mutual friends that introduced us. And um, yeah, we're going on 10 years knowing each other. So while I'd obviously been a bourbon drinker prior to that, in the last 10 years really have gotten spoiled um, in my friendship with Drew and just you know tasting incredible whiskey from him um, over these last 10 years. But my, my first, someone asked, asked me this recently and it made me think about it, but I, I think my first proper introduction to bourbon was probably 16, 17 years ago. Um, and my first really good um, bourbon that I had was probably a bottle of Bland's. And that just kind of really stuck out to me. I was gonna ask you if you recall like that first bottle that made you like- Yeah, if I'm being completely honest, I don't remember the exact first bottle, but the first mm -hmm. bottle that kind of makes, uh, that really made an impact on me was definitely Bland's. You know, the exactly. overall packaging design, the story behind it, obviously the juice itself, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that's something that we really subscribe to as a brand in terms of looking at, you know, there's no, I don't think there's any product industry or service where it's singular in nature, right? Meaning you're mm -hmm. only looking at or experiencing one aspect of it. 
it's in its totality that we take it all in. So for me with Bland's, it was kind of learning the story behind it, the bottle looking so unique and different, discovering that, you know, each individual stopper spelled out Bland's. Mm -hmm. um, all of that contributed to my experience. It wasn't just the juice I found itself. that particular note out so late in my bourbon drinking Right, <laughs> but isn't that the same? About the fact that it yeah. spells it out the word, I had no yeah. It's those little Easter eggs, right? And I think brands yeah. that um, are very intentional in how they tell their stories and how they build their brands, uh, I think it's just so much more meaningful and interesting and engaging. And that's something that, you know, we, as authentically as we can, have wanted to contribute to our brand and include in Frank August as well. Yeah, for sure. And the, the fashion aspect of it and, and, you know, being in magazine publishing and all that definitely comes through in the aesthetic that you guys have gone with for the bottle Thank you. it's just gorgeous i think it's so it's great that it basically just operates as a decanter after you're done with it i mean it's yeah, already we, a decanter essentially but then once you totally to keep it and use it and all things and i'm a glass collector i'm a borderline hoarder so uh, <laughs> now i have I two of them that i will be hoarding <laughs> so yeah i absolutely love it that was absolutely intentional you know i think again it, first and foremost, we understand that the juice itself is paramount. There, you know, that's undeniable. Um, a pretty packaging, great story, sells a lot of first-time bottles, but it's ultimately what's inside that bottle is going to what's going to get people coming back. Mm -hmm. Having said that, when we talk about experience, you know, sight and touch are typically your first experiences with a with a brand or a product. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to design something that was beautiful. Um, that was timeless in its aesthetic um, and felt different than what you typically would see in this space. You know, I okay. think there's this unspoken uh, kind of rule book, if you will, um, that a lot of people within the bourbon industry or bourbon brands subscribe to or play by, right? So it's a traditionally a very ornate decorative bottle, lots of copy, script typography, um, you know, throw on an animal for good measure, a horse, a buffalo, a chicken. Mm -hmm. um, and again, and I say that truly not in a disparaging way, it's just like those are the typical archetypes that you include and yeah. in usually building a bourbon brand and telling those stories. Um, but if that's something that you want, there's plenty of brands out there that do that. So we felt that, you know, we wanted to lean in a, in a different direction and we subscribe to the ideals that less is more, mm -hmm. uh, that to be understated is to be more confident. And we felt that it was the simplicity of our bottle design that hopefully would speak so loudly. You know, so whether it's that's- very sweet. I love it. Yeah, <laughs> whether it's sitting on the back bar um, at one of your favorite bars, hopefully it, it demands that kind of like, what is that? That doesn't look Exactly, like I was gonna say that. that. It's one of those bottles where if you're seeing it like at a bar or something like that, you can't exactly tell what it is right away. Yeah. So you're forced to kind of question, well, what's that? Like, and I think the day and age that we live in to get people just to pause and consider, even if it's for a moment, is half the battle, right? Yeah. We're, we live in a time that we're so stimulated um, through everything. Um, to get people just to pause for a moment, we think is a huge win. And I think, um, you know, I think we've, we've, we've achieved that in our bottle design. A lot of the feedback that we've gotten from our on-premise partners as well as our retail partners is is essentially validating that you know them sharing stories about customers saying you know what is that that doesn't look like what i would expect from a bourbon brand um so yeah we wanted to design something that was so beautiful too that you would be hard pressed to just throw it away mm -hmm. and consciousness is a, is a brand tenant of ours and one aspect of consciousness is obviously the idea of sustainability um, as an NDP, we obviously don't have as much control over every aspect of our brand. Fortunately for us, um, all of our partners, um, that's an important um, kind of attribute characteristic of the brand. So inherently, you know, we share those as well. Um, but through hopefully designing and creating a ball that's so beautiful that people don't want to throw it away, it contributes in some form, you know, to that yeah. idea of sustainability. The beautiful brass closure, it's, you know, it's obviously hard if you haven't seen it yet, but you can kind of a, attest to it. You know, yeah. this is nice and I weighty. Think, arguably great. the hardest, you know, the heaviest, one of the heaviest stoppers in, in the industry. Oh, for um, sure. And then, uh, you know, we designed it to you in a way that the back label. So taking one step back, we got really fortunate. Um, and when we were submitting our labels to Colo for approval, um, 
we discovered that the need for a primary front label was no longer required. So at the end of 2020, the TTB updated the regulations that removed a brand's requirement that their primary label be their front label. So that's why every single one of your beautiful bottles behind you, every mm -hmm. single one of them has a it's, label. Everything on is listed on the front, yeah. Right, so yeah. The, the timing just worked great. So we moved it to the back, and then we also put on that beautiful clear label. Mm -hmm. And D, if you wanted to, if you find the edge to it, it pulls right off Way ahead there, of you. Yeah. With zero <laughs> residue, right? I like, took it off one of them, but yeah, I was like, oh, they made it so yeah. easy. <laughs> so then hopefully, you know, it, it provides that opportunity to use it as, you know, another spirit decanter, a water craft, put flowers in it. Um, but and I do all of the above with my bottle, yeah, so. Essentially give the bottle a second life, if you will. Yeah, I love that. For the people who are non-industry, can you say, tell them what NDP is? Yeah, so NDP is a non-distilling producer. Um, Got it. So okay. as brands, you're either a distilling producer, which essentially means you have your own distillery, or you're a brand that um, either a combination of or either or purchases source age liquid from, um, or also contract distills and lays down new barrels with them. But it's another distillery that's making it for you. Gotcha. And I know that you guys' bourbon is essentially a blend of, of how many barrels? I think like 10 or so barrels. So it's, yeah, I think, you know, that the word blend used to be a four letter word in our industry, you know, um, <laughs> but there's the unique aspect of our product is it's theoretically a bottled and bond product. And the reason why I say theoretically is we have an NDA with our distiller that doesn't allow us to disclose who they are. Um, we understand that there's a lot of brands out there that are trying to kind of manufacture some kind of mystique and intrigue around their brand. And they say that we can't say who it is. Mm -hmm. We genuinely can't. Uh, it's not our decision. It was our contract distilling uh, partner's decision. So with that, we couldn't put their DSP on the bottle, which is part of the requirements for a bottled and bond product. But okay. for all intents and purposes, it's a bottled and bond product. So it's distilled from one single season, from one single master distiller, aged and stored in a bonded warehouse and proofed at it 100. And okay. it's so a distillate from one single distillation season as an NDP, we've been, we've been doing some research and I'd love, you know, for anybody that's joined um, or anyone that knows if there's been another NDP that's launched a brand as a bottled and bond product. So typically the source market right now is you get your hands on whatever you can get and you don't know where it's from. Um, I mean, you do know where it's from, but based on inventory, you know, is it Kentucky? Is it Indiana? Is it Tennessee? Mm -hmm. You try to get that. The mash bills can vary. You try to blend those together. You hope and pray that you're able to get a contract distilling relationship where you're able to lay down barrels. Three or four years down the road, you start blending those together to hopefully start to create a consistent flavor profile. And then four or five years later, if you're able to fulfill those contract distilling relationship, now you're introducing product that's exclusively truly yours, right? So it's this tricky transition that a lot of NDPs have of like what you launch with in terms of flavor profile versus what you introduce your brand with. We're really fortunate that our source liquid that you're drinking now um, is also from our contract distilling partner who we're laying down barrels with. And they're both high rye mashes. They're nearly identical. Okay. So oh, for, those of, black for those of you that have had the opportunity to taste Frank, and if you love it, you don't have to worry about, you know, four, three or four years down the road, once we introduce truly exclusively our product, is it going to taste different? It's from the same distiller. It's nearly the same mash bill. So we're, we're in a really unique uh, position as an NDP where most NDPs aren't in the position that we are in. Okay. And that, you actually kind of segued into a question I was going to ask you. So you guys' goal is to keep consistency across every batch in terms of taste profile? Yeah, for this product, you know, for us, it was important to launch with a true flagship product. Um, okay. We wanted people's first introduction to the brand to be with our flagship product. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we have some high age statement products and we could have launched with that, but it felt not necessarily disingenuine, but you know, we didn't want to launch with a very, you know, super limited release number, get people excited about a high age mm -hmm. statement and then introduce a flagship product. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted to introduce the, the brand with our flagship product. And if it's something that you enjoy now, 
whether it's your first experience or it's five years later, it's going to be the same thing. Okay. So our flagship product is this small batch Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey. It is from 10 to 15 barrel blends. Um, it's a high rye mash and yeah, we'll continue to proof it at a hundred. And um, we think that proof point is great too, with where we want the product to sit. It's obviously, we think an amazing product just to sip neat or with a big mm -hmm. rock, um, but also not be too um, precious about it if you want to mix it with a cocktail. Mm -hmm. And we feel like anything under 100, when you start to put it in a cocktail, you start to taste it a little too taste, diluted. Yeah, you taste less and less of the product itself, and you're tasting mm -hmm. more of the modifiers. So, yeah. Okay. Nice. Yeah. I love that. So, how yeah. hands on are you uh, with the actual process in terms of? Um, like the blending and deciding that like that's that's it yeah that's the flavor profile we're going for like are you in there pulling from barrels and tasting yeah so i've been really fortunate through you know through the relationships that we have in the industry to um work with a number of people some of the most respected people in the industry uh there really is this kind of mentality that you know drew had mentioned to me early on but to experience it firsthand has been and continues to be something that's an incredible part of the story in the industry of bourbon that I don't think is told enough. And that is mm -hmm. just this mentality that a rising tide raises all boats. You know, everybody, um, you know, I come from industries that probably most people do where in order for a brand to succeed, that means other brands have to fail. And I'm not saying that that doesn't exist in bourbon. There's no competition. Of course there is, mm -hmm. but there's this general sense of willingness to want to help and um that's what we've been that's what we've experienced as a brand it's been incredibly fortunate to us um so myself uh and i was able to work with one other master blender uh did our first three batches so okay. you know, we spent um spent a few days in bardstown together kind of blending these batches uh and the reason why i can't disclose this person is because he's incredibly well known respected the industry okay and we'll be able to kind brand. of tell who you're working with by the yeah exactly okay. it's got you which we also know is a little conflicting in terms of the story that we're telling in terms of being open honest and undisguised you know it's a yeah. question that has been asked to us and again these are decisions um that we frank august are making in terms of not disclosing these are our partners mm -hmm. saying hey in order to work with us you can't disclose this information um so hopefully you know, and is that because that. they don't want to because they don't want you all to be presented as competition to what they produce for themselves? Is that kind of yeah, the I think there's an, I think from it? a distiller standpoint, you know, imagine you own a distillery, right? And it's an incredibly reputable distiller, but you're also contract distilling. So you're mm -hmm. selling barrels to whoever. Mm -hmm. You have no idea what they're going to do with those barrels, how mm -hmm. they'll blend them, what they'll blend them with. Uh, what the packaging final product is going to look like, what the marketing is going to look like. So imagine a worst case scenario where, um, you know, uh, take one of the most respected distilleries, insert whatever name, and mm -hmm. then you take someone that does, takes their product and just represents it horribly. And now they're branding it of like, oh, this mm -hmm. is X brand. Let's yeah. say Buffalo Trace, right? Like yeah. Buffalo Trace is doing that's not going to look well for Buffalo Trace. Oh, so yeah. to protect them, they're saying, hey, we don't want, we just don't want you to disclose, um, you know, okay. who it is. Um, Fair. So I, I think, you know, that, that makes sense. Even the likes of, uh, you know, Willet, you know, arguably one of the most respected sought after whiskeys in the world. Um, there was a time that Drew and his family contract to still, they don't contract to still anymore. But when they did contract to still, um, they did the same thing. They didn't allow their contract distilling partners to, share that this was will it juice because they were protecting the, their identity of their brand and the brand that they were they were building so it makes sense i understand it i also yeah. understand that from a consumer standpoint you want to know more you know everybody wants to know the source of it um, and more information um so I, I get both sides um we're we're just in the position where it's it's not in our control so we we, we can't yeah. make that decision on our own as a consumer, I think maybe my position as a consumer is a little unique just because of what I do, but I don't mind not knowing the producer. Yeah. I like knowing information about the mash. I like knowing about how many barrels we use to blend, like those type of things, ear, yeah. that type of stuff. But I don't want to be influenced before I taste it totally. by knowing who produced it because like 
for instance, if you were like sourcing from Dickel or something like that, like I don't want to think in my head, oh, I'm gonna get dill or I'm gonna get this. Like totally, I don't want to know that. <laughs> I want to taste and I want to analyze for myself. Because it so sounds like I'm you're not a, mad you're, at the NDAs. Yeah, you're truly an objective whiskey enthusiast aficionado. I think there's so many times, probably piss off some people saying this, but there's so many <laughs> enthusiasts that are just loyal to a distiller. Yeah, and that influences everything where if you're if you're truly an enthusiast and it's just about the juice the the only question is is this good yeah that's the only question do Literally. i enjoy this not where is it from not even how old it is you know like yeah of course those are yeah. all things that can that, influence your thoughts too yeah of course those are all things that it's not saying that you don't have a right to know or share but if you're truly interested in is this great product it's so subjective and individual taste it that's all you yeah. need to do do you enjoy it um but yeah i think it's you know i'm always fascinated by the people that are just like you know diehard blands fans they love mm -hmm. blands when you realize it's a single barrel product you know yes. we all know how underneath an umbrella. <laughs> and unique and varied each individual barrel can be yet yeah. you're just saying you know i like all of them you kind of lose some credibility yeah. there, you know, when you exactly. hear people talk There's like no that. way you like every single exactly. one that they put out. There's no way. Not <laughs> if no every way. barrel is varied, for sure. If you've had no, the opportunity, which I'm sure you've had to do vertical tastings, mm -hmm. uh, blends or any single barrel product, um, it's really remarkable how different those flavor profiles are, you know, and, and that's what me, I love about whiskey in general. Exactly. That's what I was, to me. That's what's so beautiful about the story of bourbon. You know, it's wood, grain, and water, and time. That's it. Mm -hmm. And you can have barrels sitting next to each other from the same lot in the same rick house, literally sitting next to each other, and they can taste dramatically different. You know, mm -hmm. but to me, again, I'm I know consistency is key, and, and I get that, and I appreciate that. But for me, it goes back to that question that I just said: Does this taste good? Yeah. So even if the flavor profile is a little different, or even if it's a lot different, to me, it's just a matter of like, does this taste good? Um, so, yeah. yeah. And we, I think we have also enough of those huge, like legacy houses that are producing consistent juice. Like we have our go-tos that we already know what to expect from anything that they're putting out. And that's great. I really am enjoying the releases and the brands that are coming out where we can expect these releases to taste different. Totally. So you know, like maybe if I don't like batch one, I might like batch two. I might yeah. like batch four. Like, I like that. Totally. I think for us, that was the, you know, the last thing the industry needs is another bourbon brand, right? There are literally hundreds of them and mm -hmm. brands coming out every single day. Um, but despite that, we still felt that there was a unique opportunity in the category. And, you know, as competitive and <clears throat> cluttered as the category of bourbon is, there's predominantly, not exclusively, predominantly yeah. been one story, one strict narrative, and it's been told over and over again. And yeah. unless you subscribe to that, you weren't considered real, you weren't authentic, you weren't bourbon. Yeah. And that story has always been a legacy story or origin story. Some family recipe passed on from generation to generation, a distillery that's been revitalized after 100 years, a yeast strain that's been recently discovered, some kind of lineage to prohibition, you know, again, not saying anything negative about those stories, but they've become so ubiquitous that it's kind of homogenized the category of bourbon. It's essentially mm -hmm. said that's what bourbon is. Yeah, like and that's the story. Exactly. And mm -hmm. we believe it, it absolutely is a huge, huge part of it. But we believe that bourbon has a much more expansive story to still tell. That in order to, for bourbon to be real or authentic, it doesn't mean that you have to have that legacy origin story. Yeah. So for us, that's where we saw the opportunity. You know, the opportunity was to kind of create this modern expression of what bourbon can be, what it can represent, while at the same time reconsidering its identity as America's native spirit. And we think that's what's a compelling kind of story that we want to tell. You know, we want to sell as many bottles of Frank August as we possibly can, of course. Of but if we can create a conversation larger than the bourbon itself, then maybe we have the opportunity to tap into culture. And if we have the opportunity to tap into culture, maybe we have the opportunity to create something really special. 
And that's what we're looking to try to do with Frank August. I think y'all are definitely um, on the right track to doing that. That's for sure. It's like Jimmy just joined. Hi, Jimmy. Who's Jimmy? Jimmy Johnson. I like Seven that. time NASCAR champion, IndyCar racer. Oh, okay. See, I'm not a car girl like that. Hi, Jimmy. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> I can appreciate a good car, though, when I see it. Yeah. Um, so we actually got a question submitted from the Bourbon Whiskey Library. He said, they said, I don't know who's behind it. Approximately how many barrels do you plan to lay down each month slash year? Um, the, the short answer is as many as we possibly can. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, you know, the as an NDP, you're really beholden in terms of your growth and how you can scale a brand. Mm -hmm. You're tie is directly tied to your barrel inventory. So for us, we're trying to leverage all the unique relationships and contacts that we have within Bourbon to get as many barrels as we possibly can. Um, so we're constantly, you know, looking for barrels, both aged barrels as well as new make, new fill. Um, okay. So as many as we can Ooh, okay so i don't know if you're allowed to tell us but do you already have an idea of some of the older ages that you guys plan to release like about how old you plan to or y'all still in the process of tasting and seeing you know how how old you can go with it yeah we're 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 probably there the the okay. two new expressions that i can speak to that we are releasing um so we've got our our small batch that's out now um we're almost sold out, which is kind of hard to believe. Our our full year's inventory is pretty much sold out in, in three months. And even that, we've we've had to scale back um, in terms of reorders because we didn't want there to be this huge lull in the marketplace without product. Mm -hmm. And we're just kind of pulsing it in with key partners. Uh, but the, at the end of October, beginning of November, we'll be releasing a single barrel expression, uh, which we're excited about. Those will be, just be our picks. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we're also releasing a program called Case Study. Uh, so case study is uh, the kind of architecture movement that um, was kind of birthed in the mid 40s and span about 20 years. Uh, it really kind of um, was the genesis, if you will, of kind of like mid-century modern design. It was all about um, building more affordable housing using um, exploratory practices and materials and all those kind of things. So that's the inspiration behind the name. Um, but okay. case study is where we're going to be exploring all of our different finishing techniques. So our first case study program that we're uh, launching alongside our single barrel will be case study 01 Mizunora, which is Japanese oak. So okay. we've got barrels now nice. that are aging with some Mizunora that we're really excited about. We've been tasting them and seeing um, how it's been impacting the flavor profile. And if any of you guys are fans of Mizunora, you know that it's, a, it's an incredibly porous wood. Um, so its ability to impact flavor just happens a lot quicker than more of the harder. That's what I was going to say. So you don't need to age it as long then. Yeah. In prison. Okay. And it's well, so that'll with... be and that'll be a second finish. That won't be aging. Aging. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you know, I think um, those are the kind of things that we want to do. So the case study program is something that hopefully a few times a year we'll release new and different case studies. Um, so again, like the first one's Mizunora, we got our hands on some really beautiful, um, uh, sherry casks from like 1948, mm. um, that are meant mm. to be dumped in November and we should get them about four weeks later. We'll start aging those kind of see what happens with those as well. But okay. we feel like the case study program is where we really have the opportunity to kind of explore outside the traditional boundaries of bourbon. You know, bourbon is so stringent you know, in terms of what makes a whiskey a bourbon that, mm -hmm. you know, when anybody asks a question of like, what makes your whiskey or bourbon so different from anyone else? I think it's really hard to answer that in a genuine way. There's mm -hmm. such stringent requirements that you really can't deviate, you know, beyond that, where yeah. I think- Yeah, legally that, you can only be, but so different. <laughs> exactly. So I think that's the reason why you're seeing a lot of these brands explore all these different various finishing techniques. Um, because I think that's the that's the area and opportunity where you get to do that, uh, which is exciting. You know, Barrel obviously is probably the best example of that. You know, their whole brand is based on that idea and that premise, which you know I think is really beautiful. They do a ton of experimentation. It's pretty cool with them. Yeah. Um, we got Jeff Perkins asked, "Are you planning on releasing any barrel proof slash cast strength bourbons?" 
Yeah, so that will be our single barrel. So our single barrel program will be cask strength. Um, you know, we believe that uh, we'll let the drinker decide, you know, what the proof point should be. So right now they're, they're tasting around 125. Okay. Um, so I think that's what they'll, we'll, somewhere between, I think 125, 127 is where they're going to come in at. Okay. Um, and I know a lot of people, again, associate a higher price, uh, higher proof point with quality. Um, yeah, but, it's so not true. <laughs> it's not. It's yeah. so not true. It's when you start to add some water in that it really kind of exposes its true flavor profile and characteristics. Mm -hmm. A lot of times that alcohol content can hide, you know, some impurities or mm -hmm. um, just some flaws in the bourbon. So it's really when you start to add some water and open it up that you really get to see. That you really get to see. Yeah, that's why yeah. I like tasting things at cash strength because I just like to control my dilution. Yeah. I like to know kind of at what point with how many drops do I like it? Because that changes for everybody. Totally. So, yeah, I agree. that'd be fun. Well, I can't yeah. wait till the single barrels come out. Um, we have Chris Haynes said, forgive me if I missed it earlier. You didn't. Um, love the bottle itself. Have you had issues getting them? And do you plan to stick with that bottle shape? That's actually a great question. Yeah, it's a great glass, question. Glass these days is like. Glass is crazy. Great. You know, I think when we first started speaking with our distributor, um, one of the quite, very first questions they asked was, do you have glass? Just kind of knowing, anticipating, this was two years ago, you know, mm -hmm. the, the issues uh, that the industry was seeing and kind of forecasting how they were going to get worse. So, you know, I think it's a testament to the unique relationships that we have. Truthfully, we have no business having made a brand new mold in the time that we did. We did it in the middle <laughs> of the pandemic, right? Yeah. Um, to get glass, period, even if it was, you know, sourced existing styles was hard enough, yeah. let alone to be able to develop, manufacture, produce, uh, pack, ship on a container, get it to the US, um, go through the whole port system. Um, we were able to do that. And I think, again, that's just a, another example of the testament of the quality of partners that we have. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, when you look at um, the people that have been involved in the brand, we've really kind of leveraged that, not in an exploitive way, just leveraged it in terms of being able to get these kind of things. So getting our glass bottle, our closures, labels, um, you know, all of that done within the time frame that we did is something that we're really proud of. Um, but getting back to this question, no, we're going to, we're going to keep with the bottle design. Yes, the glass uh, issues continue, um, but we've been fortunate to be able to navigate them and, you know, we're still in a good place with that. Okay, cool. So in your, in your different iterations, like the um, case study and, and that. I'd How will we differentiate them? Yeah, not even, yeah. well, yes, that's part of the question. I was going to ask, like, is it going to be labeling on the back that changes essentially? So it's going to be uh, the neck labels, right? So oh, okay, nice. So this will be our. You I know, like that. This it's is nice and subtle, flagship. but yeah. you'll see it right away. Exactly. So mm -hmm. our single barrel is going to be a black label with gold foil printing, and then obviously yeah, okay. handwritten with all the information. Uh, the back label will look the same, but you know it will have corresponding information. Mm -hmm. And then our case study is going to be a, a matte gold label with black hand, uh, black writing on it, uh, black mm -hmm. printing on it, I should say, um, and again corresponding. So the idea and the thinking is hopefully, you know, the bottle design is so distinctive that, you know, if you're at your favorite bar that carries Frank and you're 20 feet away, just through the bottle design, you're going to know, oh, they carry Frank August. And through the neck label, you'll eventually Don't know, know like, if you see is. a black label, oh, they've got a single bar. I want to check that out. Or yeah. they've got a gold label. They must have a case study program. So, um, again, we wanted it to be very intuitive, you know, not complicated, something that, you know, people could easily remember and wrap their heads around. Ooh, I love that. And just a note to everyone that's watching, we do have more Frank August available on Silvox now. Um, so I did share the link in the comments, but I'll also share the link in our IG story after we log off. Um, for us, I think a couple of people asked, was it available on Silvox? The answer is yes, it is. Um, and so, yeah, we've got that available for y'all now. And we have one question that is not whiskey related, but I'm actually <laughs> curious too. Um, Anissa Evolve asked, Jonathan, what's your zodiac sign? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Pisces. I don't know what that means, but I'm a Pisces. Okay. Are you yeah. March? 
March. Yeah, March. Okay, 16th. nice. My my wife is a March Pisces also. Yeah. That was so even kill. Just very chill people. <laughs> I love that. Oh, uh, so when you guys so how long was the process from the time y'all had this brainchild of wanting to start this brand to the time that you guys kind of made like your first shipment of cases? Uh about two years from like nice. when we really kind of um pursued it uh fully uh okay. to the point that we had it and it really was kind of you know it was a process for us to you know there are certain check marks if you will that we mm -hmm. ran up against and you know as we continued to pass through them it just kind of became it made the opportunity or the idea more and more fully realized until we got to the point where we thought like oh okay this is this is now more than just a wishful thought or an idea but we really have an opportunity to create something unique and special here um, but yeah. from beginning to end uh in terms of like truly moving forward with the idea to product being delivered right around two years okay Cool. And are your business partners from the same uh, industry as you or y'all coming from different? Yeah, so different one worlds. of my business partners um, uh, is in the advertising agency side as well. He owns okay. his own agency. Um, and then my other business partner um, has kind of spent his career. He used to be a professional athlete and now he works with, you know, some of the best brands across different industries and disciplines, helping kind of promote and market them as well. So. We okay. come from a, a pretty strong advertising, marketing, branding background as a team, mm -hmm. um, which I think is, you know, one of the strengths that we really haven't even fully tapped into yet as a brand. You know, the brand's only been launched three months mm -hmm. and we just started in the last few weeks doing our first kind of paid advertising, which was basically, you know, some Instagram sponsored posts. But mm -hmm. beyond that, there's been zero advertising or marketing behind the brand. And that was intentional. You know, we wanted to see what the natural groundswell response was to the brand and from there kind of gauge how we wanted to continue to market it. So yeah, you know, there's it's, been a it's, nice organic kind of flow of conversation about y'all since I'll drop. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I think wanted, uh, yeah. distribution is doing a good job of talking y'all up too. I guess that's their job because they got to make yeah. the sales. But um, you know, it's it's a great point that you make because you know one of the this was probably about seven or eight years ago. Well, long before. I would even considered pursuing this in a professional capacity, but I used to travel a lot um, for work internationally, um, but domestically. But if I was in a small bar in Paris or Berlin or London or Austin, mm -hmm. I always seemed it always seemed to have a will it expression or two on the menu. And it mm -hmm. always just kind of stood out to me. And I always thought, how the hell does Drew know about this place? And I remember having a conversation with him about it. But again, this was a long time ago and saying, like, how do you how did you know about X bar here in Berlin or wherever it might be? And he he had said, like, I don't. And His distributors like, do. Yeah. And I said, well, what yep. do you mean? He said, that's that's our distributors. And I said, yeah, but surely you're like knowing you knowing these establishments, you must be curating these uh, lists with them in some way. And he said, no. And he had shared that, you know, his distributors were just as responsible for building Willet to what it was that as than he was, which I thought was just such an incredible statement to make coming from a master distiller owner to give that much kind of praise recognition to their distributors. And it's something that always stuck with me. So mm -hmm. when we started to build Frank, one of the things that was top of mind always was what will our distribution strategy be? Yeah. You know, will we want to go with one of the national majors, the Southerns, the RNDCs, or do we want to go with a small regional play? Mm -hmm. um, we ended up going with a small regional play. Um, our, our, our primary distributor that we're working with is Pacific Edge Wine and Spirits. Okay. So they distribute in California, Nevada, Arizona, Washington, and Florida. Um, and, you know, they, they have probably one of the most respected whiskey portfolios in the industry. They do distribute Willet. Uh, they mm -hmm. distribute Springbank, uh, Barrel, uh, mm -hmm. Wilderness Trail, Pinhook. Um, so, you know, incredible whiskey portfolio that we're that we are incredibly proud to sit alongside of as well. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, it's you know your distributor. And then on the northeast side, we've got Prestige, who's doing a great job of of talking you guys up. Exactly. So that's how so, I got familiar with you all was through Prestige. Yeah, Mike and Chris and the team over there are incredible. Mm -hmm. Um, so we'll, you know, we wanted to be very targeted as we launched the brand. We didn't want to go too, too wide and thin. 
you know, the last thing that we wanted is to kind of get people excited in a market and then just kind of disappear from a product yeah. standpoint. So uh, we're in about 10 states uh, and that's what we're going to kind of stay focused in. I think the we're looking to expand maybe in one to two markets next year, uh, but that's about it. We want to continue to build deep, meaningful relationships with the partners that we have in each of the markets that we're in. And then once we do that in a really established way, then we'll look to expand and, you know, grow the brand. I love that. Oh, Hood Sommelier asked, what is the estimated time for the single barrel program? I guess it means like when you estimate kind of dropping your first round. Yeah, end of, end of October, beginning of November. So we are bottling. Oh, fun. Yeah, Best we're bottling mid-October. So okay. we're bottling really soon. Um, and then it's just a matter of, you know, getting it shipped to our warehouses and then our distributor getting it out to, you know, all of our partners. Um, but it should be available to cu customers by end of October, beginning of November. Okay, cool. I love that. So yeah. it might be too soon to, to be able to answer this question, but I'll ask. Um, with you all releasing your own picks, are you eventually at least planning to have the option to allow people to do picks through you all? Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely, we want to offer a barrel picks to, you know, some of our key and important clients and partners. Um, so a barrel pick program is something that we'd love to roll out sometime next year. And that's what we're okay. looking at right now. So yeah, definitely. Okay, well, Soapbox will be throwing their hat in that frame. <laughs> that. Oh, the answer, this question just got asked, is it going to be on Sealbox? More than likely, if we've got anything to say about it, yes. The single yeah. barrels will be on Sealbox for sure. Um, yeah, it's going to be very, it's that. going to be very limited. You know, mm -hmm. um, the number of bottles that we're looking at is probably around a thousand bottles of each mm -hmm. uh, of single barrel and our first case study program. You know, we'll, we'll look to continue to expand that both in terms of offering and, and size quantity, if you will. Um, but mm -hmm. for right now, we're also trying to be as strategic and as smart as we can be. You know, mm -hmm. the, the reality is we could be hitting year two and three years projections now if we wanted to, if we wanted to pull product forward and kind of chase that business. Mm -hmm. um, but we feel that it's, again, it's, it's smarter to be, very, be consistent with our strategy, grow it a little bit more than what we anticipated, mm -hmm. um, but kind of continue to build that strong foundation and that demand of the brand and get it to that point. We know, we, not sounding arrogant, we know it's going to come. Mm -hmm. um, but we want to do it in a way that just feels natural and right. Um, so that's what we're trying to do right now. Yeah, I love that. We're not going to toot our horn a little too much. We tend to be pretty crafty about getting our hands on allocated bottles. So we'll do our best, no, guys. We'll totally. do our best. <laughs> yeah, Blake has his ways. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, um, yeah, I love that. Okay. Well, mm. I won't hold you all afternoon, Jonathan. This has been fabulous. Thank oh, you. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. This has been yeah, great. Thank you for having us. We appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, I definitely is happy to learn more information about you all. I was already just kind of <laughs> ooing and awing over the design of the bottle. So to get the the behind the scenes and the thought process from from you on what you guys were putting into this, I think it's really dope. Thank um, you. And I'm looking forward to what you guys release in the future. Definitely looking forward thank to Thank you so much. Yeah, we so. appreciate it. Yeah, not a problem. Guys, like I said, I'm going to share the link um, to the actual product page on Sealbox on our story. You can also just go to sealbox.com and just search Frank August. They're the only, um, it's the only product up there right now, obviously, the small batch. So feel free oh. to do a search. Let yes. Have, one thing I forgot to share um, yeah. that I thought would be important, uh, the name itself. So, so the name represents yes. the story How that did, we want to tell. That is yeah. me. <laughs> uh, so the name represents the story that we want to tell in bourbon. So Frank is inspired by one of my business partners, late father, and August is inspired by my other business partner's son's middle name. So Frank representing our past, understanding our heritage, where we've come from, where we've been, and August representing all of our future ideals and aspirations and just the idea of looking forward. Uh, because traditionally, the story of bourbon is told by its past. It's told by looking back. We want to pay our respects. Um, to that heritage in our past, but at the same time, look forward. So um, some, a lot of people have asked, you know, is it a real person? You know, what's the um, inspiration or story behind the name? So that's what it is. I love that. Thank you for thinking of that. I yeah. don't understand how I didn't think to ask that first. But yeah, um, yeah I love that explanation, though. That's like, and then the last August thing is my that? birthday month. Oh, yeah? Oh, mm -hmm. when, when, what's the date? August 9th. Happy belated birthday. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, the last thing I'll share with that, because that usually kind of spurs the idea, the thinking behind the the ethos of the brand. If you've seen it, it's it's on the back of the label. It's America's spirit. Be frank. So it's this kind of double entendre. So America's spirit referring to, referring to Frank August in terms of mm -hmm. like liquid, the juice itself. Be frank. Mm -hmm. And then um, America's spirit, the idea of being open, honest, undisguised um, and sincere. Be frank. So that's a conversation dialogue, if you will, that we really want to have around the brand. Um, so hopefully if anyone's been following our Instagram and seeing the content that we're putting out, everything that you will ever see from the brand will always point back to something American. It's this, in the same way that we're asking people to reconsider the identity of bourbon, we're asking people to reconsider the identity of what it means to be American. Um, so that it's a lot more of a, involved process of unpacking all of that and telling mm -hmm. that story from a brand point of view. Um, but it's something that's incredibly important to us. And I love that. You know, it's a great conversation starter. Well, you know, I think ultimately the reason why you see so many legacy origin stories is because there inherently is some authenticity to it because something existed in the past, right? You can, mm -hmm. it's something that we can look back to in a very kind of real tangible way. Mm -hmm. um, but to create a authentic story today, around bourbon that doesn't subscribe to that kind of story is really difficult. So for us, this, this theme of reconsideration is what kind of runs, it's an undercurrent underneath the brand. So again, reconsidering the identity of what it means to be bourbon, but reconsidering the identity of what it means to be American. Um, you know, taking away politics, how, however polarizing that can be, even beyond that, there's such strong associations and stereotypes that come to mind when we hear the word American. Right, like mm -hmm. baseball, apple pie, Elvis Presley, Ford, Chevy, Coca Cola, Obesity. Levi's, Wrangler. Yeah, go down the list. Right? <laughs> Just and, so many things. <laughs> <laughs> um, but as amazing a, of American institutions as they are, it's fairly limiting for as rich and as diverse of a story that we believe American represents. So we thought to challenge ourselves and ultimately challenge others to look at American through a different lens. So we started to look at things like music and we heard the likes of Dylan, Cash, Miles Davis, Ella Fitzgerald, John Coltrane. Oh, yes. We looked at art and saw people like Warhol, Basquiat, Pollock, O'Keefe, Coons, Judd, Herring. We looked at architecture and the, and the likes of Frank Lloyd Wright, Frank Geary, John Lautner. I'm a big design guy, so I naturally looked to the people like Ray and Charles Eames, Florence Knoll, George Nelson, Paul McCobb. Um, you can't help but think of literature in uh, Hemingway, Baldwin, O'Keefe, Twain, Harper Lee, uh, Ginsburg. You know, the list goes on and on and on. Yeah. But D, every single one of those names that I mentioned, every single one of those legends, those icons, the work they made, the art they made, the indelible mark they left on culture, every single one of them are American. Their work is American. And we thought, how beautiful would it be? How powerful would it be if we heard the word American and our minds went to those places as opposed yeah. to the expected? How that would be an identity of American that we'd want to build a brand around. That would be a story of American that we would want to help tell. So everything that you see that we do, hopefully, maybe that starts to make a little bit more sense for anyone that's listening. Yeah. Um, we're always pointing back to something uh, inspired by some aspect of being American. Um, and again, whether it's an architect, an artist, you know, um, a musician, uh, a cook, whatever it might be, we feel that there's so much to celebrate of what it means to be American. And bourbon being America's native spirit feels like just, you know, an incredibly appropriate conversation to have. And maybe now more than ever before just because oh, sure. those are all things that we can get behind and support and celebrate and believe in, no matter what you believe in other aspects of life. Um, so that's what we're trying to do as well. Um, I love that. I think everything from the aesthetic and how you all approach it, I mean, it's, it's clearly very art inspired. It, everything, I mean, your website, all of it, it is very clear that there's a artistic inspiration that kind of comes behind it. So I love that there's also this, like you said, that double entendre of just wanting to challenge what people's first thought when they think of to be American. I think that's really, that's really dope. I'm glad you made a point to, to share that. Yeah. I think it's worth, it's worth noting we, for sure. 
Yeah, you know, like the the short version of that of America Spirit Be Frank is this idea of being frank, right? And mm -hmm. I think we we live in a time right now where that isn't encouraged, mm -hmm. right? To to be frank, pun intended, um, yeah. because we're so concerned with potentially saying the wrong thing or being interpreted in the wrong way, and being forever canceled. being yeah labeled or canceled that it's better just to like, you know what, I'm just not gonna say anything. And, you know, not to date myself, I'm 45, uh, not old, but not young. And I grew up in a, in a time and age where you could do that. You could say and do stupid things, you know? And yes, I'm not saying there shouldn't be consequences for them. But if you look at a 10, um, that's the only way that we as people, uh, as a culture, as a community can grow. Right. If people aren't afforded the opportunity to make mistakes, say things that they shouldn't learn from them, then what, you know, what then no one learns anything. Exactly. So we think it's a pretty provocative statement to build a brand around right now. Be frank. Um, yeah. So we have a lot of different ideas in terms of how we want to unpack that and tell that story. Um, you'll see a kind of frankly speaking series that will launch soon. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure it's probably going to be fairly challenging to get people to want to <laughs> participate in that for the very reasons well, we're discussing. Um, well, but if I, you're looking for people to add to that list, I don't <laughs> mind speaking frankly. So. Absolutely. Um, so again, I think, you know, we want to create a conversation around the brand and around bourbon as a whole. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, a question that we've asked ourselves from the beginning is why do we deserve to exist? And I think every brand needs to be able to answer that question. And if you can't answer that question, you know, yeah, I think it really kind of puts you in an interesting position. And for us, we believe that we, we exist because we want to elevate, evolve the identity around and conversation around bourbon. We want to be able to have these frank, open and honest conversations. Yeah. And, you know, Frank August is just kind of a platform to do that. And, you know, we think, that's what makes our story a bit unique within the category and space of bourbon as a whole. And I think in some ways, I think that's what started to resonate with people. And um, again, we love everything about the history of bourbon. You know, we've said it before that the history of bourbon, the story of bourbon has been written. You know, we're not looking to rewrite that in any way, yeah. shape or form, but if we can contribute a new chapter to it in some way to start looking at it through a different lens, um, you know, we'd be incredibly proud to do that. So, you know, that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, I think that'll be a great, um, and who knows how many years from now when the next, like, historical bourbon uh, written text will be put out. But I think um, when it does hit that time and you guys are included in that conversation, it'll be really cool to kind of see how you all help kind of shape this conversation around it. It'll be interesting, you know, hopefully there's and an the opportunity for that. And the branches of conversation that kind of come as a, as a result of it, I think that'll be pretty yeah. dope. So I'm looking forward to that for sure. Well, thank you again, Dee, for having us. Thank you for the support of the thank brand. You. We really appreciate and it. Of course. I'm looking forward to all the things that are coming out. So, yeah. All right. I appreciate it. This is great, Jonathan. It's so nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. And if anyone missed any part of this, we will be sharing this on our page also, so you can catch the full conversation there. And yes, have a great afternoon, everyone. All right. You guys take All care. All right. Have a good one. All right. Take care.